Mic check one, two. Okay. We're just going to go with this. This is fine. Okay, we'll try that again. Good morning and happy Sabbath, one and all. I am really grateful to be here this morning, and I'm grateful not only that I'm here, but I'm also grateful that I'm feeling good this morning. I'm going to tell you what, when you start going through struggles with your health, you start to realize how good you had it when you were young. <laughs> now, many of you will say, what do you mean when you were young, Pastor Farr? You are very young right now, right? Yeah, okay, all right. But, but what I'm pointing out is, is that we are not often grateful for all of the blessings we have because we've never been without them. Hmm. Now, it's very interesting in our passage today because Jesus is describing a reality in which his followers have been allowing themselves to be the hands and feet of Jesus. His followers have been out there giving water to the thirsty. They've been visiting the prisoners. They've been loving on people that many in society would look at and say, oh, well, I don't know why you're wasting your time on those people. I mean, these are the least of the people that you need to be giving your time. Don't you know there's important people, right? And as we look at the passage today, you're going to see something very interesting about the people who are doing good for those that would be considered by most of the people in the, in the world to be the least of these, people that you wouldn't give your time to, people that you, I mean, come on. What are you doing helping these people, right? And, and this is actually something that's a very common theme in society today, right? I mean, if you want to find out how to get ahead in life, you can go on social media and you can find all of the most current influencers on the internet. And they will all tell you, here's how you live life. You put yourself in the place and in the position where you can get closest to the people who can benefit you. And if someone can no longer benefit you anymore, if they can't help you get where you're going, then you need to replace the current people in your life with people who can help you level up and get to the next level. It's all about creating relationships only with people who have something to offer me to get me where I'm going in order to get to the next level so I can elevate myself to some future reality when I will finally arrive at the dream. But Jesus here in Matthew 25 talks about the reality of what his people are like living in a world which is just like the one I just described. He describes that his followers are different than the people living in the world. So let's go ahead and just look at Matthew chapter 25 together. You can turn there with me in your Bibles. If you are uh, here in person, you've got Bibles there in the pew. Maybe you brought your own. You can use your phone. Plenty of Bible apps online. If you're watching online, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. And before I start to read this, though, it's important to explain the context. Now, as all of you know, I have not preached a single sermon in going on a year and a half, two years. I'm not sure where we're at in that process. We're somewhere on the way to my second year here. I have not preached a single sermon without mentioning which verse? Matthew 24, 14. Okay, good, good. Some of you knew it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so in, in, in almost two years, I have never preached without mentioning Matthew 24, 14, which says, and we will preach the gospel of the kingdom and all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then... Okay. All right. Good. And so Matthew 25 is in the context of a question that the disciples have been asking, asking Jesus. Now, remember in my previous sermon, I spoke to you about the rich young ruler, which came to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do that I will inherit eternal life? Right? Okay. Now, uh, Jesus' response is, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, right, and then follow me. Now, let me ask you a question. 
Was the man being saved because he sold everything he had and gave it to the poor? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at our passage for today. And I wanted to set it up by explaining to you the context because we are in Matthew chapter 25, okay? And so after what we see in Matthew 24, the disciples come to Jesus. They have a very similar question to the rich young ruler, right? They're wanting to know, Jesus, what will be the sign that we're at the very end of the world? Right? In Matthew 24, they're asking, what's going to be the sign that we're at the end? What's going to be the sign that your, your kingdom is finally coming into power? But why are the disciples asking the question is the key here. Well, think back to our man that says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? See, when we ask, when will the end be? Is the end here yet? Are we in the time of trouble yet? Are we running out of time yet? Are we at the end yet? What are we really asking? Well, how long do I have to get ready? <laughs> and so what's interesting is, is that the disciples, in a lot of ways, are asking the same question that the rich young ruler did. But this question adds yet another element. Why are the disciples wanting to know when Jesus' kingdom is coming into power? Is it because the disciples are super concerned about all of the people that would be considered to be the least of these? Why is it that the disciples are wanting Jesus' kingdom to come into power? Hey, Jesus, when is this kingdom going to get set up? Because <laughs> they're thinking to themselves, you know what? When your kingdom comes, all the people we don't like are out and we're in. I, I mean, come on. Let's get real here. They're, they're not asking this question from a place of concern for you and me. They're saying, hey, Jesus, when is your kingdom coming? We're pretty sure that we're, we're ready for the Samaritans to be out. <laughs> yeah, we're ready for those Samaritans to be gone. Okay, so when your kingdom comes, we'll get rid of them. We're ready for the Romans to be gone. We're ready for the people who don't look like us, walk like us, talk like us, act like us, think like us agree with our opinions. We're ready for the people who've got the money and the power to get out the way so your kingdom can come, Jesus, because we're ready to be rich. And so when's your kingdom coming? Okay. And so, so I don't want to let the disciples off the hook here because they're not asking Jesus, when is his kingdom coming into power? Because they're concerned about the least of these. And what's very interesting is, is when the rich young ruler asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, hey, you know what? Sell everything that you have, come to me, follow me, and by the way, give everything that you have to the poor. Disciples say, when will the sign of the end be? And Jesus starts telling stories. He starts telling parables. And, and, and after he tells the parables, we come to today's passage, Matthew 25, verse 31. Here we go. We're ready. Everybody online viewing Matthew 25, 31. We're going to read all the way through this. Let's check it out. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep at his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Oh, and then pay attention to the answer here in verse 37. Matthew 25, 37. Pay a special attention to the answer here. Then the righteous will answer to him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The people here are confused. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, G Jesus, <laughs> When were you hungry and we gave you food? We don't remember doing that. 
And then the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let me just make a note here. The eternal fire prepared at the end of time is made for the devil and his angels. Notice that Jesus does not include anyone sitting in this room as being someone that the fire is prepared for. Is that good news? All right. It's good news to me. I, I thought maybe more of you would be excited about the fact that the fire is made for the devil and his angels and not us. But that, that, that's good news. All right. Because when someone makes a fire, if, I, if, I'm, if they're planning on me being the firewood, I'm not excited about that fire. But if somebody makes a fire and, and we're going to sing Kumbaya and make s'mores, I'm excited about that fire. All right. So verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't even visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? Notice how the answer is the same. We don't remember seeing you hungry or thirsty. We don't remember seeing you a stranger or naked or sick or in prison. And then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, so I guess if all of us want to go to heaven, then we just need to start doing really good things for the people considered to be the least of these, and then we'll go to heaven. Is that the, uh, is that the moral of the story? <laughs> I once remember, I, I actually, I was in school, and I was attending this very big church. This church was huge. And um, I remember one Sabbath, they preached on this passage, and they had refrigerator magnets that re they were going to give to everybody after church. And I tell this story to give you an example of how I don't think this text is to be applied. The, the preacher got up and talked about how we come to church, and we sit in the same pew, and we listen to the sermon and watch the program and we go home and we never spend time with anybody else. And then he says, oh, but look, Jesus tells this story about how the, the, his sheep that are going to be in his eternal kingdom do good for the least of these. And so his idea is we're going to give out refrigerator maintenance for you to put on your refrigerator so that every Sabbath when you get up and you make breakfast and you see the refrigerator magnet, this refrigerator magnet is going to remind you to do kindness for those considered to be the least of these. And his great idea was, is every Sabbath now, you, you are going to go ahead and invite people that you would have originally never invited <laughs> to come home for lunch. These were the least of these. <laughs> and I'm sitting here listening to this thinking, yikes. <laughs> now, I will say to you, I was very grateful for the sermon, though. Because after the sermon, for the first time in my entire time as a student, I got invited home for lunch, and it was really good. <laughs> Are you guys picking up what I'm putting down here? It would be very easy to hear Jesus' uh, response to, uh, Lord, when is your, what's gonna, when is your kingdom going to come? When are the signs of the end going to be? And oh, by the way, Lord, what's your kingdom going to be like? And it would be very easy in the context to hear Jesus saying, hey, listen, you know what? Let me tell you a little bit about what the sheep are like that are going to be in my kingdom and what the goats are like that are not going to be in the kingdom. It would be very easy for the disciples to respond by like, <laughs> guess what, guys? Let's have a contest to see who can do the most for the people considered the least. Let's go. But there's a problem. Because Jesus isn't saying that you're going to go to heaven if you do all of these good things. And Jesus isn't even telling the goats that are not going to be in heaven that they're not going to heaven because they didn't do the good things. There's an element of the story 
that's very important. And we miss it almost every time we read it. But let's go and take a look. Because if we want to understand what Jesus is asking us to do or how he's asking us to live, we need to go to Jesus because Jesus is our example in all things. Can I get an amen for that? Jesus is the one who came into this world, Emmanuel, God with us, the word that was in the beginning that was with God and was God, decided to come down, put on human skin. He allowed himself to be made lower than the angels just so that he could come and walk in the footsteps of his father, doing what his father wanted him to do, saying what his father wanted him to do, so that we would understand what this is all about. So let's take a look at Jesus' example. Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10 in verses 46 through 52, I'm not going to go through the whole story. We have a man there by the name of Blind Bartimaeus. Now, you guys help me out. Blind Bartimaeus. Is Blind Bartimaeus a guy that you're really hoping you run into as you're doing your errands around town? And, and why? Why? You come out of Walmart, you just did your shopping, it's Sabbath evening, come on, I'm tired, and someone's standing there with a sign, alms for the poor. I mean, this is, are we hoping that they'll move to every corner that we go to around town so that we run into them and make multiple donations, right? No. Blind Bartimaeus is not the most popular guy in town. Blind Bartimaeus is blind. Blind Bartimaeus is homeless. Blind Bartimaeus doesn't have a job. Blind Bartimaeus probably hasn't had a shower recently. Blind Bartimaeus is poor. Blind Bartimaeus is a beggar. And so if Blind Bartimaeus hears you coming, he's going to start crying out and asking for you to take care of his needs. And you'll notice in the story that when Blind Bartimaeus one day hears a commotion at the gate of the city, that Jesus is coming by and he says, what's the commotion? There's people coming because normally this is Blind Bartimaeus' opportunity to start crying out. Is this the moment? There's a bunch of people coming through the gate. I need to start crying out alms for the poor. And they say, Jesus is coming. And suddenly, blind Bartimaeus, who would normally be asking for alms for the poor, starts crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And notice the crowd's response. Hey, blind Bartimaeus, could you please keep it down? How annoying. Could you, listen, you're here all the time. Jesus is here now, and he's here for the important people. C could you please be quiet? Jesus has an important mission. He's getting ready to set up his kingdom, and that's going to be good for all of the haves. And not so much for people like you, Bar Bartimaeus, because you're one of the have-nots. But my favorite part of this story, which is why it's the one story I choose to talk about in depth, is when suddenly Jesus turns. Blind Bartimaeus hears the crowd telling him to be quiet, and what does he do? He cries out all the louder. Friends, I got to tell you something. When I was going through my prodigal journey, when I was going through my pain, when I was steeped in sin, when I was homeless sleeping in the bus stop, I didn't let anybody, it didn't matter what anyone, I'm going to tell you something. When you know that you're one of the least of these and Jesus is coming by, you don't care what the crowd says when they tell you to be quiet. You just cry louder. And so he keeps crying, and Jesus looks, and he says, come here. And suddenly, the crowd changes. Suddenly, the people go from rebuking him and telling him to be quiet to saying, hey, blind Bartimaeus, good news. The most important guy in town just called your name, and he wants you to come to him. And blind Bartimaeus throws off his cloak, and he runs to Jesus. And Jesus sets him free from being blind and from being a beggar and from being at the mercy of others. Okay, so we have another story. Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17, we will notice Jesus is out traveling when suddenly 
ten lepers come to him begging for mercy. Are you guys seeing a, a theme here in these stories? Ten lepers come to Jesus begging for mercy. But here's something very interesting about these lepers. Let me point out, first of all, when the ten lepers came to Jesus, he didn't just choose to heal like only the Jews. He healed them all. The ten lepers came to Jesus saying, Jesus, have mercy on us. They knew that he was their only chance. <laughs> None of us ever get to go home and see our families again. We can't go to the temple. We can't offer the, we can't do any, we can't be in society. We got to be out here. And when the lepers come crying to Jesus, he heals them all, the Jews and the Gentiles. Interesting. Now, there's another thing that we want to notice about this story. Right? The lepers all had something in common. Number one, Jesus healed them all. Number two, the lepers all had something in common. And here's the interesting thing. It was the commonality of their leprosy. It was the doomsday diagnosis that they had been given, which actually caused them to be together at Jesus' feet. Mm. Oh, friends, don't miss this point. Anyone in here got leprosy today? Okay, so certainly we haven't all gathered here today because we're a colony of lepers who are only allowed to hang out with each other. Okay. That's not what we have in common. Mm. So what does this story show us? <laughs> well, I, I want to tell you three things that the story of Jesus healing the ten lepers shows us. It shows us something about what Jesus is trying to say in Matthew 25 when he is describing the difference between the sheep and the goats. Check this out. You are going to be mind-blowing. It shows that God values the people considered the least. Can I get an amen for that? God values the people considered by everybody in society to be the least. Because I'm going to tell you something. When people had leprosy, you were not their friends. You didn't go near them. They were required to cry unclean, 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 so that nobody would ever come near them. And the only friends and family you had were people who already had the doomsday diagnosis. And so here's this beautiful little family of ten hanging out, coming to Jesus' feet. All of them are in the same boat begging for mercy. God values people that we would never want to go near. God loves people that society considers to be the least. Number two, this story shows us that God honors faith. Notice that, that when the lepers realized that the man that they saw was Jesus, they came running to him begging for mercy because they didn't have any other chance at hope. I'm going to let that sit. There. You hear what I said? The lepers knew that they didn't have anybody else but Jesus. Well, they knew they had to have faith in him because Jesus, you're, you're Emmanuel. You're God with us. You're the one that spoke the world into existence. You're our only hope. Nobody else wants to come near us. We can't even get a meal. We can't even get help. We, we're just trying to stay alive one more day. Jesus, we're desperate. And they fall down in his feet. Jesus, if, if you would, you could make us well. You could do it if you want to. They had the faith. So number one, God loves those who are the least. Number two, God draws close to, God loves people who have faith in him. Number three. Well, we have to go a little further in the story to get to number three. Because it's very interesting, friends, what happens as soon as the leprosy is removed. Oh, you need to pay attention to this part. Because, friends, this is the thing huh, that separates the sheep from the goats right here.
Because all of the people whose father was Abraham in the scenario, they got healed. And all of the people who were the Gentiles, who were considered the least of these in this group, they got healed. Let me ask you a question. How many of them came back to Jesus after they got healed? And what was different about the one? For all of you uh, watching online, I want you to know that we love the online viewers as much as the in person attenders at church. Can I get an amen for that? One. One. One man, after realizing that he's left the presence of Jesus, he's going his way, and he realizes my leprosy is gone. Immediately, he's trying to find his way back to the Savior of the universe. Immediately, uh, humbled at the fact that, that God healed him, a Gentile. He runs to the feet of Jesus and falls at his feet, and he has gratitude. Friends, God loves the least. God loves those who put faith in him. And God loves those who are grateful. And I love how God uses the Holy Spirit to bring the service together because today the songs were all about going to heaven. The text that we're looking about is about the kingdom of heaven, right? Right? And Doris shared with us a text in our morning welcome. In all things give thanks. Oh, you guys. The Holy Spirit's always bringing the service together, isn't he? Okay, let's just go quickly through some other examples. I'm just going to give you the rapid fire other examples. Because we just looked at one example that shows more clearly... What Jesus is talking about when he tells the disciples that at the end of time, when judgment comes, when Jesus comes, that not only will he come in all of his glory after the gospel of the kingdom is preached and all the world is witnessed to all the nations, but when he comes, he's the one that's going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? Number one. Number two, he says, the people that are the sheep are the ones who did for the least of these. Because when they did it for the least of these, they did it unto me. The one who are the goats, who are the ones who didn't do anything for the least of these. But then they're like, oh, we don't even remember even seeing anybody that needed help, Jesus. I mean, come on, cut us a break. But I posit to you today, friends, that if you hear that story and what you take away from it is, I need to start going and doing good things for people that I consider to be the least of these, you miss the point. You, you don't understand the story. Because going and doing nice things for people that we consider to be the least of these is not going to get you into the kingdom. So let's go on with a few other examples to make sure that we get the po actual point that Jesus is making about the judgment and about his kingdom when it comes. Here we go. Other examples. In Matthew 9, 10 through 17, Jesus is accused of eating and sharing a meal with people who are known sinners. Accused. <laughs> Did you hear? Jesus was out in the market with those wine bibbers, those alcoholics, those druggies, those people living that licentious life. Jesus was down there, and he had a meal with them. Oh, friends, you don't understand the accusation. Because not only is he sitting with sinners having a meal with them, but, friends, he's having a meal with them. You need to understand the context of the society that Jesus is in. Here's what you do if you're in Jerusalem. I was in East Jerusalem learning Hebrew. Okay? I was there during Ramadan. Every day from first thing in the morning, you hear a cannon fire. The fast begins. In the evening, you hear a cannon fire. The fast ends. And when the fast ends, everybody at their houses has food outside their houses ready so that people can break the fast and come together and eat. And when you eat at Ramadan, you go to the table and the food is there in one big preparation and you grab yourself some bread and you dig right in with your hands. Everybody's at the table 
digging for food because they haven't eaten all day. Everybody is hungry. And I want to tell you something very interesting. It is not safe for tourists, they say, in East Jerusalem, because in East Jerusalem, I was there studying Hebrew as a Christian who is becoming a pastor for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, surrounded by people who have a different religion than me, and I was told, oh, these people are terrorists. You've got to be careful. You've got to stay inside. <laughs> you don't want to go outside at night. You know what I did? I went outside at night. Right around the time the cannon fired, because I knew something about the Islamic society that isn't true about the current day Jewish society in Jerusalem. Sorry, guys, the truth hurts. Because when I went to Western Jerusalem, I never got offered a meal. Nobody wanted to shake my hand or talk to me or be friends with me or invite me into their house, and anyone I talked to was very inconvenienced and very upset that they had wasted part of their life listening to the words that came out of my mouth. But when that cannon fired and there was food on the porch, do you know where I was? I was at every house that I could attend, breaking the Ramadan fast and eating food with the Muslim people. And here's, here is the reason why this is so important. It's because once you've shared a meal with Muslim people, you are now part of their family, and they will defend your life to the death. And so pretty soon, I was going all over East Jerusalem, and I was part of the family. And everybody knew who I was 10 weeks later because I was eating food with people not like me. So why is that important? Because Jesus shared meals with sinners, and when he ate those meals with sinners, what he was saying to the people who thought they were great and had earned the kingdom of God is, guess what? These people I'm eating with are part of my family. And the people who considered themselves the haves didn't like it that Jesus was eating with the have-nots. Don't you know that when, li li listen, don't you know that when you set up your kingdom, Jesus, that we're not sharing with them? Hey, don't, don't, don't you know that when we, when we finally get back into your blessing and our kingdom is great like it once was, when, when the walls of Jerusalem are built even bigger and prouder and louder, that we're taking all your blessings and keeping them inside. We're not sharing it with people like that. Those are the have-nots. Don't you understand the program, Jesus? Because when we get the blessing that you came to give us, we're not sharing. Yikes. Let's go to church now. Right? Number two. John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. Here's another example. Here's, here's another thing that really upset people. Jesus ate with sinners, signifying that he considered them family. Oh, boy. Here's something else Jesus did. Jesus forgave sinners. Oh, dang. <laughs> now, hold on, Jesus. You're getting a little carried away with this forgiveness thing because every single time you forgive one of them, that means we got to let them in. Aw, oh, darn. Oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. And it's going to be kind of weird in this, in this particular story because the woman that they brought to throw at Jesus' feet, they said, you know what we can do? We can catch Jesus in a trap. You know what he's going to do? He's going to forgive her showing that he doesn't uphold the law. Oh, no, 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 but if we do it publicly, guys, guess what? If we do it publicly, he'll have to pronounce that she has to be stoned. Certainly, he's going to keep the law. And this is good news for us because, one, it gets rid of the sinner, right? 
Or if Jesus doesn't do what we want him to do, it exposes him as the problem and we can get rid of him. Right? And if he, if he says stone her, then not only do we get rid of Mary, but we get rid of the evidence. It, because the thing is, is that she had been caught in the public sin, and theirs was still a secret. And, and if, Jesus, if Jesus tells the people to stone Mary, then we get rid of the evidence that we're sinners too. And Jesus says, oh, you know what? H hold on a second. Let's have a little art class time. I love going down to the Pendleton Christian School when we're doing art class. These kids are creative. They make all kinds of things. And usually, whatever they make, they say, Pastor Far, I made this for you. It's so cute. But Jesus made some art that day in the sand that nobody wanted to see. Because he got down on, he started writing in the sandbox that they didn't want to share with little old sinner Mary. Wanted to get rid of the evidence. And when they got close and they wondered, Jesus, what are you doing? You're supposed to pronounce her stone. Like, let's get on with the party, buddy. You can hold our coats. We'll do the dirty work. And they get close and they see Jesus riding in the sand and they realize, wait a minute. This Jesus happens to know something. He happens to know that none of us can throw a stone unless we are willing to have a stone thrown at us because we're guilty of the same sin she is. Dang. Okay, one more example. One more example. John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, you have a story of a woman sitting at a well. Number one, she is not a Jew. Number two, she is a woman. Number three, she is a known sinner in her community. Jesus should never even waste the time to talk to her, and yet... Jesus not only talks to her, but he offers to bless her with living water. And then after she actually accepts by faith the blessing that Jesus is offering, and she discovers that he's the Messiah, that he's the Savior of the world, she immediately takes the blessing Jesus gave her and runs back to her hometown to tell all of the people who she was ashamed to be seen with at the well. Only just minutes previously, I was ashamed to even be seen in public. And now I'm not ashamed anymore because I've been forgiven. I've been blessed by God. I've been filled with the water of living life. And now I'm the one in the middle of the town standing before all of the people who I used to be ashamed to even be looked at by and I'm saying glory in the highest the Savior has come you see what's beautiful about this woman is she was the least of the least of the least of the least of the least and Jesus called her blessed and the best and sent her back to bless others perhaps now you're seeing the story is all about What does it look like for a human being to actually follow Jesus' example? How is it that I'm a sheep instead of a goat? How is it that Jesus says, well, you got to do for the least of these, and then you'll be in my kingdom, but it's not really about just doing for the least of these in order to earn getting in Jesus' kingdom. How do we figure this thing out? We figure it out by going to Genesis 15, verse 6, and Genesis 12, 2. I'm going to rapid fire these. Don't miss this part. Write them down. Think about it later because I'm going to rapid fire this at you and then you're going to have to think about it on your own. Here we go. Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abram believed and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Do you notice the common thread in every story I've told about Jesus' example? Jesus came. Every single one of the pe people in that scenario believed and guess what happened? I mean, the sinners he was eating with, they believed he was the savior of the universe. The lepers that he healed, they believed he was blind Bartimaeus believed. Mary believed. The woman at the well, do you, do you picking up what I'm putting down? Abram, the most holy and righteous man in all of religious literature, loved by Christian and Muslim alike. Okay, we can talk about Abram. Abram believed, and it was counted unto him as 
righteousness. One other part of his story that's important, and it relates to the woman at the well who was the least of the least of the least of the least, and even lesser than that. In Genesis 12, verse 2, <laughs> Abram is now Abraham. God has changed his life, changed his name, moved him away from the home he was living in with all of the idolaters that he was living with who were worshiping the one true God and false idols as well. He's moved him away into his own land, and he said, guess what I'm going to do for you, Abram? I'm going to change your name and make it Abraham, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm blessing you in order to make you a blessing to every human being who has ever lived and ever will live. Okay, back, back to the context. And this is how we land the plane today. Matthew chapter 25. When we look at the context, we are looking at Jesus telling about what the judgment will be like he starts out by talking about the ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. The difference between those who are wise and those who are foolish is some have the oil. Take note of that. Okay, what else happens in the chapter before we get to the, the verses we covered today? We have the talents, right? One was given ten talents, one was given five talents, one was given one talent, and understand a talent is the same as 6,000 days labor. That's roughly 16 years of your life. In that time, that one talent represented what most people would make in a lifetime. And what does Jesus say? Well, it seems like he says that the one who had the 10 made 10, and so he was saved. And the one who had five got five more, and so he was saved, but the one with one he didn't, he didn't, he buried his, and he didn't make a profit, and so he wasn't saved. But if that's what you take away from it, you miss the point, because at the end of the story, the servant says, the reason I dug my talent in and put it in the ground, my lifetime's earning, the reason I took my life and buried it in the ground is because I was afraid, because you're a master who sows where you, you harvest where you didn't sow. And what does this reveal? The judgment that comes on this man doesn't come because his life did not earn a double portion. But instead, the judgment comes on him because the reason why he wasn't blessed is because he didn't believe in the master. Uh. Are you guys picking up what I'm putting down? <laughs> you see... Here's the part that's amazing. This is what I love. Jesus picks guys like me. Jesus blesses guys like me. And no matter what I go through in this life, I get to tell other people that Jesus wants to choose guys and gals like you too. And he wants to choose them out there too. And he wants to choose the people watching online. And he wants to choose the alcoholics and the prostitutes and the drug addicts. And he wants to choose the prisoners and the thirsty and the hungry and the widows and the orphans. In the Gospel of John, here's my last two points. Gospel of John. Gospel was preached by John and he says, repent and come and be baptized by water. And he says, oh, by the way, though, you need to know something. <laughs> you need to know something. Are you ready for what you need to know? You need to know that there's one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to loose. You know what he was saying? There's one coming after me. I wouldn't even be worthy of washing his feet. Because when you wash someone's feet in that culture, you loosed the sandal strap. Okay, so here we go. There's one coming after me whose sandal I'm not even willing to, I'm not even worthy of loosing. I'm one of the, listen, you guys think I'm great and you're coming here to be baptized by me? Guess what? There's one coming after me that's so amazing that even I'm one of the least of these. And this was mind-blowing to the people listening. And he says, here's something that this one who's coming after me has that I don't have that he wants to give to all of you. 
not one of you, not two of you, not the greatest of you, even the least of you. The one coming after me is going to baptize you by water, and he's going to baptize you by fire. The one coming after me, when you come and you repent to him, he has the ability to bless you with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which will empower you to be a blessing to anyone and everyone your life ever touches from the moment you receive it. You see, Abram's not different than you and I. Abram believed it was counted unto him as righteousness, and he got to talk to God. And guess what? When we believe, when we repent, when we're baptized by water and we say, Jesus, I believe that when you came and died, it wasn't just to forgive me, but it was so that you could go back to our Father in heaven and sit at the right hand of God so that when I pray, believing that the Father will give me the Holy Spirit so that I can be blessed to go from the least, a sinner deserving of death, to being like you, one of the best, a son or a daughter adopted by God into the kingdom, and I can live the rest of my life as someone who has been given eternal life through your gift. I don't have to do nice things for people. I want to because you did it for me. Oh, I don't do good things for the least because I think that I'm the best. I do good things for the least because I once was lost, and now I'm found. I once was blind, now I see. I was once the prostitute, but now I'm saved. And the last point, the conclusion. Friends, Jesus doesn't tell his story because he wants to guilt trip us into doing good things for people who we think are not as good as us. But instead, he tells his story so that we'll come to him realizing that we are the least of these too, so that we can be blessed by him and have him live through us to be a blessing to every single person our life ever touches. And lastly, the final point. We are not the savior of the universe. We only work for him, and there is a reason why I'm so happy that I'm a part of the Pendleton and Pilot Rock Church District and that you're all part of my family. Here's the reason why. When Jesus came and died, he realized that when he gave forgiveness and the Holy Spirit to each and every single one of us, that we would become part of his body. And, and there's a reason why it's important for each and every single one of us to know that we are not the savior of the universe. It's because Jesus' plan for salvation makes each and every single one of you a part of his body so that everyone that you reach with the blessing that God gives you can become part of his body too. You see, in God's economy, there's enough room for everyone at the table because when he forgives you, blesses you, brings you into his kingdom, he also empowers you to be part of his body so that that you can be one of the people that he can use to reach the right person at the right time in the right place saying and doing the thing that's going to reach them because his Holy Spirit does it through you. You see, the ones who did for the least of these didn't do it because they even realized that they were doing things for people who were worse than them. In fact, they actually saw the people as just like them. And, and, and the reason they didn't remember all of the good things that they did when Jesus says, come into my kingdom because you did it for the least of these and when you did it for them, you did it for me, is because it wasn't them doing it. It was Jesus doing it. And next week, Next time I preach at the Pendleton Church, on the fourth Sabbath this month, we are going to look at the new covenant because Jesus says the reason that you're going to love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and the reason why you're going to love your neighbor as yourself is not because you're good people, it's because I'm good. It's because my Father's good. And if you'll let me knock on the door of your heart, and I'm going to finish with this, if you'll let me knock on the door of your heart, and if you hear me knocking on the door of your heart, if you'll come and open the door... I'm going to come inside, and I'm going to sit at your table, and I'm going to eat with you. And when Jesus comes to your house, even though you're one of the least of these, and you're a sinner too, and he sits at your table, what he's telling you is, you're in. You're part of my family, and now you're no longer the least, but instead you're the blessed, and I want you to bless others throughout all of time. Oh, friends, I want to be one of those that says, when did we see you? When did we see you, Lord? 
And you know what's going to be beautiful when I ask that question? And when you ask that question, we're going to be looking into his face. And that's true for everyone here today who believes. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, no matter how much I pray before church, you can't teach me to preach short sermons. I got to be a pile of rock. God, I have love in my heart for these people that are listening to the sound of my voice right now, not because I'm good. Not because I'm the best. But because I'm the least and I know it. And that's why the fact that you love me means so much. God, help us to see that we're just like them out there. Because I believe if we'll let you live in and through us, there's going to be a whole lot less of them out there and a whole lot more of us together that know that we're part of your body. Lord, when did we see you? And when will we see you again? Amen.